Eric Davis, thank you very much for taking the time. Happy to be here. So, Eric, you are an author and your work uh, covers kind of the intersection between technology, esotericism, you've also talked and written about psychedelics. So those are topics that I'm personally very interested in and have been for many years. There are also topics, it, I found it can be difficult to get, to get people to understand why they're so relevant right now. So I thought we would start with that and get your take on that. Why, why are these important things for us to be looking at right now? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because I mean, I've been, I've been writing and thinking about these things uh, for a long time, since probably since the, let's say the early 90s. And in that period of time, they were pretty esoteric. I mean, not technology, obviously, although even then when I first started writing about the early internet mm -hmm. culture, it was still pretty small, you know, before the World Wide Web came out. Mm -hmm there was a whole sort of underground uh, esoteric freak intellectual zone you know through uh, BBS servers and you know and, and alt you know uh, alt groups and um, muds and moos and so that was like the early my early experience of even kind of digital technology was this sort of underground that was online uh, and those were the f sort of first days of virtual reality. Everyone was thinking about virtual reality, how that was going to change everything, and then they, you know, the physical mm -hmm. manifestation of that took a lot longer. Uh, and then these other things were, were marginal in a lot of ways, psychedelics, the occult, mm -hmm. the paranormal. Uh, you know, there was, they popped up on TV, you had the X-Files. You know, there, were, there were signs of them, but in general it was sort of a marginal thing to follow. And now none of it's marginal anymore. And that's one important reason is to go, why? Why did this happen? Why is it now that um, invest, investment bankers and fashion designers and, and academics are interested in taking ayahuasca or uh, that, the, you know, that there's a sort of resurgence of popular culture about witchcraft and paganism, that there are these younger witch movements that are coming up and um, that uh, the occult it sort of permeates more and more of, of popular culture. Uh, what's going on? What's, why is this all happening now? And I, I think it's, um, there's a couple of reasons. One, one is just that con consumer capitalism likes to find an edge that it can colonize that has some kind of flash. So what initially appears to be strange and challenging we can move into and then more and more people have access to it mm -hmm. and it becomes like a cool thing for a while and then after a while it gets kind of absorbed uh -huh. and another fashion trend comes along. So I think some of that's what's going on. But I think there's a more, more important, deeper dimension which is that partly because of the spread of technology, of, of, of digital technology, of media, of smartphones, of the internet, uh, of social media, that for a, a variety of reasons, the way that consensus reality was structured in the past, even in the immediate past, is eroding. And as it erodes, as it becomes harder to, let's say, distinguish between the online world and our physical world, because now our phones are with us everywhere, the sensors are with us everywhere, we're mapping this real space to this space and going back and forth more and more, and we're looking at our phones all day long, we're like interrupting our physical real reality with these information flows, those two worlds begin to kind of break down. You know, again, talking about the 1990s, you know, we had this now very quaint, corny phrase of cyberspace. It was a different place. When you got online, you went to cyberspace. And in cyberspace, there were different rules. You could be different characters, you could build fantasy worlds, you could meet da 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 da. And we don't think that way anymore. It's not, it's, it's kind of one interwoven digital, re, you know, actual material space. This is a, an interesting point. Um, which one is real? You know, is, in your mind, is that kind of cyber, what we used to call cyberspace, which is blended into our physical space, is it less real? Is there some underlying reality that it's kind of masking us from seeing? Or is it, is it just as real as everything else? Well, yeah, I mean, the language of reality is a, real, a really tricky one. Uh, and, you know, I think it's, you, you have to kind of define your terms, what do you mean by this and that. But uh, I think that the reason that things like psychedelics and the occult are more resonant now is because they both represent sort of rich and creative forms of 
let's call it irrationality, even though I don't really like that word because it implies that rationality is the real thing and irrationality is a deviation when it's something more like magical thinking or mythological thinking, thinking that does not follow along mathematical logic or purely causal physics or something like that. And maybe in the past, you know, we li like in the mo recent past, in the 20th century, we, we lived in a physical world that was ruled by the laws of, of physics and science and chemistry. And, uh, and then we would escape maybe to films or comic books or uh, maybe even we would be in a religion and we'd do something that was kind of different than that. I feel like right now, even if we're secular people, our experience of the everyday, of, of just ordinary reality is less and less ordinary, at least in the traditional sense, because these virtual or algorithmic or digital logics are now completely embedding themselves in our, not just in our, exper you know, in our experience of how the world works, mm -hmm. but even our experience of ourselves and how our minds work, how we work, how, where we are, where are we in the phone? Am I spread out through the networks mm -hmm. that my phone connects to, all of my friends or all of the information sources? Am I there? Am I in a body here interacting with the screen? Am I the screen? Um, that these things, aren't really abstract questions anymore, that we're on some level we're playing with them and psychedelics and the occult and other forms of irrationality are actually in some ways good models for trying to feel our way into what it means to be no longer operating in this kind of concrete space-time that we recently were because everything is being you know, unraveled. And then once you, once you start to unravel consensus reality as a physical world where there's laws of physics and also social institutions that organize reality so we we trust the newspaper we know they're not always true but you know we more or less feel like the newspaper has a good line in on reality and you know when I grew up there were that there weren't that many news sources so you know even though there was a left wing and right wing and whatever there was a sense that everybody was talking about the same reality. That's gone. You know, the actual feeling of consensus reality has fragmented into these multiple worlds with different basic assumptions about how the world works. Is there climate change? Is, you know, is there a conspiracy? You know, is, is the earth flat? You know, all of the stuff that, again, previously was very marginal is now widely distributed through reality. You walk down the street, all these normal looking people, that person might be a flat earther, that person you know, might believe in the new world order or that, you know, that person believes in UFOs. You know, it's, it's much more widespread because the nature of the media has changed so much that once you're looking at a particular kind of information source or a certain kind of world, you just get more and more feedback that supports that view and there's more and more reason to distrust everybody else. So we're all learning how to distrust everybody else and to conf uh, conform to our particular worldview, and that erodes the sense that there's some larger consensus reality that's weaving us together. So we're kind of let loose in this very fragmented, it's like people used to complain about postmodernism in the 80s and early 90s, it's like you know, now, we're, now we're living in it, now we're living real relativism or whatever because it's just how we experience the world or trying to communicate with other people. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really hard to have a conversation with a, a flat earther or, or a, mm -hmm. uh, a certain kinds of conspiracy theory because y there's no basis. You, can, you, mm -hmm. you know, like, well, no, I mean, climate change is real because, you know, our scientists show that this and they're like, no, that's a fabrication and it's mm -hmm. being used by special interests. And you're like, well, where is the point where we both, other than the English language, mm -hmm. where we both can kind of agree on something? Yeah. So that splitting, I think, is, is making our experience less rational in a lot of ways because rationality is partly an incredibly robust and dependable language of consensus. My background is in um, teaching meditation then also being involved in the psychedelic world and most of what I talk and write about is the importance of bringing together meditation that's kind of coming into centeredness and using that in the psychedelic experience because of the same reason it sounds like of the world we live in, when everything is hyper-relative, when, when you don't have a solid ground, I think it's very important to find that inner sense of centeredness where we're still in contact with the world and each other, but we have this kind of groundedness. So 
Would you agree that like, because it's quite a serious situation to be in, it seems like, you know, we're in this kind of world that doesn't make sense anymore. What do you think we should do? Or what, is, what are some of the ways that we can navigate that world? Well, let's, let's take that one because I think that what you just said is, is both very true and insufficient. Mm, right. And th let's, let's go with the, the very true part. I mean, I just, you know, I just published this book, High Weirdness, you know, drugs, esoterica, and visionary experience in the 70s, and I'm mostly writing about what I would say from, our, from this current conversation is kind of the beginnings of this crisis as seen through the lives and minds and writings of these very far out characters, Terence McKenna, Philip K. Dick, Robert Anton Wilson, reading them not as prophets in a capital P sense, but as people who are recognizing that once you get popular culture and media and psychedelics and the and the, you know, the, the, the way in which reality itself is manufactured through our beliefs and you get all those things going and you intensify your experience, things can get extremely loopy, both in your lives and your minds, but also in some sense in the world, world at large. And that now we're kind of in that larger logic. And one of the reasons I wrote about Robert Anton Wilson, who's not particularly well known, probably the least well known of, of all of those guys, uh, is that though he has this little cult his approach to these questions, I think, is actually the most relevant. And his version of sovereignty is, I think there's, we have to be careful with, with the idea of sovereignty. I'm not sure how, how your friend was using the term, but, but just let's just take it as a general term. There's, there's the sovereign as the isolated individual who is re in control or responsible for all of their experiences and can therefore, in some sense, control, shape, direct their reality. So sovereign in terms of sovereign power, sovereign command. But I think there's a different sense of individual responsibility that has some of those elements, but is also, how to say this, more open to the fact that we, we are in a vertiginous situation where there's no real ground and that part of what you're, you're holding on to is the terror or let's just say disturbance mm -hmm. of not really being able to believe and yet still being confronted by decisions all the time that require something like belief or at least something like, like ethics. Mm -hmm. And what Robert Anton Wilson did is that he personally, he was, he was, he was more or less a libertarian but not in the evil Ayn Rand sense. He, hate, he hated Ayn, the Ayn Randians. He was more of like a man of the people, socially conscious, but still radically anarchist kind of person. And so anarch, one of the things that's attractive about anarchism in our current moment is that it requires and demands a kind of responsibility that you take for your own experience, for your own actions that you, can, you, know, you can't really be an anarchist and blame everything on everybody, on everybody else, even if it is other people's responsibility. So Wilson, Wilson is coming from this attitude and he's, he's starting to notice that if you, if you, you know, start to go down the occult route, take a lot of psychedelics, experience with what he calls brain change, experience with positive thinking where you're kind of programming your own perceptions. The things get very loose and very malleable, right? And, but, so how do you treat that? How do you think about that? And, and he really tried to hew to a certain kind of, of uh, skepticism. Skepticism both in the sense of not really trusting things, of, of, of you know, believing that evidence is a good thing to try to understand how the world works, even if it's not entirely sufficient. Mm -hmm. But, you know, definitely paying attention to science and evidence in that sense. But also embracing a kind of um, willingness to not know, ultimately, what's going on. And the story I tell is the one that he's, he's doing all this crazy stuff. He's writing satirical books about conspiracy theory and occult uh, ideas and mysticism and radical politics and so he writes this whole Illuminatus book with a friend of his that's full of all this stuff you know and it's very relevant now although it's also you know very much a, a book of its times mm -hmm. but then once he's doing all these kinds of personal experiments in California in the in the mid early mid 70s basically he kind of loses the plot 
and he enters into a world where he, he, he fully believes that he's receiving uh, transmissions from an extraterrestrial intelligence associated with the star system Sirius. Mm -hmm. And he's getting all these synchronicities that are supporting this and he's reading books that are supporting it and he basically enters what he calls Chapel Perilous. And Chapel Perilous is this kind of paranoid place where all these weird stories are coming to be very vivid in your life. And he, as he puts it, there's only two ways out of Chapel Perilous. Either you come out as an agnostic, mm -hmm. this kind of skepticism that I'm talking about, or you come out as a stone-cold paranoid. And so he goes through that and he gets out the other side and we kind of you know, talk about that a little bit. How did he do that? Yeah. How did he get out of it? And you know, in a way it's a very extreme story of like psychedelic over, mm -hmm. you know, too much psychedelics and psychosis and things like that. But I also believe that it is a, a very good metaphor for, for us today in terms of we need to work with beliefs and understanding and we need to work with reason and skepticism but even more fundamentally than that we need to sort of um, trust ourselves both in the ability to engage alternate possibilities and then also withhold assent uh, and you know it's not an answer because it may, we, may, we may need to believe certain things so strongly like we may need to believe certain things so strongly about the climate that we can do nothing but do the things that will prevent true calamity so I'm not saying that you know agnosticism and an unwillingness to believe is like the answer but on the other hand what I think now is that for the most part our information environment is um, toxically driven by memes or concepts and that often disguise themselves around ironic ideas so you think oh I'm just being ironic I'm just holding things lightly but you're actually starting to become uh, woven into a certain belief structure or a certain way of seeing, seeing the world and so it's very important for all of us to practice um, the, the, the ability to be in profound ambiguity uh, with a sense of even urgency to resolve it mm -hmm. and not resolve it yeah, or be more choosy yeah. about how the resolution comes rather than doing the emotional form of resolution which is often where the trap is yeah that there's paradoxes aplenty in this right I mean I'm thinking we use a, a technique uh, in our retreats and our events called inquiry which originally comes from A.H. H. Almas and the kind of diamond essence work we use that a lot Absolutely. Um, and that that's very interesting because when you're an inquirer it's kind of like a talking meditation and there is implicit in it is I don't know but also there is an implicit sense of there is some truth somewhere even if it's just a personal truth of how do I feel about this or what's what's going on in the space right now and so that paradox is, um, there's, you know, I, I, there's a great quote, I forgot who said it, but a, a question you answer, a paradox you live with. And this mm. sense of just having to live with that. Uh, that's something I want to talk about Terence McKenna, because in High Weirdness, you also cover Terence McKenna. He also shares that sense of um, trying to make sense of this complexity is not the way to do it. You know, I think he has this famous phrase of kind of ride the wave. So where does Terence, like why did you choose Terence McKenna to, to include with those three thinkers? Because it's Robert Alton Wilson, Philip K. Dick, Terence McKenna. So, so why Terence McKenna? And who was he as well for any of yeah, you who don't know? that's fine. I mean, I, um, Terence is someone, you know, I, I knew personally. So that was, that was interesting to me because in the 1990s he became, you know, quite well known in the underground as a sort of raconteur, not quite a guru, but uh, definitely someone that people would, were inspired by to, to, to especially to uh, take DMT or take ayahuasca or take high dose mushrooms. So he was sort of a, a mouthpiece for, you know, he, one time he, he said you know, basically his role was to just give permission. So he was a very kind of charismatic speaker, a weirdo who also seemed to be having a good time and, and a, a good humored person. Uh, who was saying, you know, check this stuff out. Like, if this has any validity, if, don't listen to me. You know, go out there and, and, and do it yourself. And so he was really, you know, the most colorful and sort of verbally, creatively interesting thinker in the kind of psychedelic renaissance of the last, you know, 25 years or so. And still influential even, even after his death in, in 2000. Um, and then the other, so, so that was why I just was very interested in him and, and he hasn't gotten a lot of 
you know, kind of serious treatment of his life. I mean, my book is based on a dissertation, so I was actually getting a degree, but, you know, thinking hard about these guys that usually people don't think about very much at all. And then I turned it into a more accessible book. Uh, but I wanted to see what happened when you thought, thought hard about these guys. Um, the other reason was just that uh, what, ha what, what, sh what these three figures all share is that they all have these extraordinary experience, life-changing experiences in the early 70s. These like more than just a normal trip, like mm -hmm. something lasts longer, too long, and you got to get out or, or you got to embrace it or you got to integrate it or whatever. So I already mentioned Wilson's serious transmissions um, and, uh, and Philip K. Dick really around the same time had this ex experience he usually called 2374 in which he encounters this extraterrestrial force that is sort of you know, healing him from the fallen world and then it, it initiates a whole series of dreams and synchronicities and paranormal things that he writes about and thinks about for the rest of his life. It's really the last, his, the last you know, eight years of his life is sort of dominated by this experience. And then in Terrence's case, he and Dennis went down to the Colombian jungle from, uh, uh, Terrence had been in Berkeley before and then abroad, uh, and they uh, had this epic mushroom experience called the Experiment at La Chirera, and that's like the core story of his life. You know, he later wrote a book, True Hallucinations, his brother wrote a book, they also wrote a book together that came out of their, their visions here. And it was, again, when you read the trip, it wasn't a normal trip. Something happened. They went, they got, at the very least, they, they, cr they cracked in some way. Uh, uh, but, but it had more, um, you know, it had more uh, sort of pattern to it than a mere psychotic episode. So it becomes a very interesting thing to think about. And all three of these experiences were similar in certain ways, different in other ways. And they all eventually saw the similarities. Like, Terrence McKenna was like, oh, my experience was like Philip K. Dick. And Wilson was like, my experience was kind of like Philip K. Dick, kind of not. And they mm -hmm. referred to the Wilsons. And, you know, so it was, there, there was a shared sensibility here. And so what it, what it made me wonder is like, what, what are these similarities about? What's going on? Why, why are these elements there? You know, there's an element of science fiction, breakdown of fact and fiction, heavy uh, synchronicity, yeah. some stuff that looks like traditional religious experience or mm -hmm. mystical experience but then a lot of stuff that doesn't look like yeah. traditional religious yeah. experience and like what is that mix about? And so I'm really just interested in going why, why is this going on? And so some of the answers are historical, they kind of come from similar backgrounds or they have similar influences, but I also think it has to do with the time, with what was mm -hmm. actually happening historically, even technologically in the early 1970s which to my mind is really the beginning of, of kind of our era, like the, where, the era that we're at this kind of unraveling intensification mixed with a pervasive banality that we don't really know what to do with. It's such a, it's a very strange, it's like this banal apocalypse uh, that a, a lot of the technological and cultural and even economic trends that set that up really come out of the post 60s Exper experiment and experience. So they all are ways of kind of un grappling with, with where we are now. And Terrence, and that one of the things that all three of them shared, to get back to our, the main topic of our conversation, is a certain kind of skepticism, mm -hmm. a certain kind of willingness to be in ambivalence and ambiguity, a definite commitment to inquiry, maybe not in the specific form, but in the larger sense that you, j especially Dick, he just kept asking questions. You know almost pathologically, like compulsively, he would, he would answer his question, what happened to me? He'd create an answer and then he'd yeah. immediately break it down and start again as if he, he needed to keep asking the question. And this was, after all, the era of the seeker. Mm -hmm. And what is the seeker? The seeker is the person whose religion or spirituality takes the form of an endless search. Yeah. Not a home, it's not like, I know, you know, I know God and God loves me and loves my family and I'm going to grow crops and go to church and that's all it is. Yeah. It's about the home. It's about the hearth. It's the, seeker spirituality is about the search. It's about the drift. It's about, in a way, it's a more restless, it's the more restless life we live as 
modern, you know, post-religious consumers where we're like, what's our lifestyle, who are we, what's the thing we're going to find, blah, 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 blah. And that's the way I want to get back to what I think is the limits mm -hmm. of the sovereignty model. And th there's a couple of lines into it. One, I think the most obvious and the most politically important one is that there is a, a strong connection mm -hmm. between the kind of self that in some ways contemporary consumer capitalist wants us to be yeah. and the kind of self that is often pointed towards in spiritual work. So the capitalist thing is that it's basically, you could call it the achievement self, mm -hmm. where I'm constantly working on myself, improving myself, becoming more productive, becoming more efficient, more balanced, more integrated, so that I can be more creative, mm -hmm. more in tune, more responsive, more uh, able to uh, to be flexible in relationship to changing conditions, keep myself happy, keep myself productive. Now there's a lot of great things in that list and in fact one of the challenges of our moment I believe is the way in which things that are genuine goods are deeply bound up with things that are, are, are less good and we don't always see them. So for me uh, that is a little too similar to the way in which that aspect of meditation or that aspect of spiritual work which does turn back to the self and recognizes that the self is sort of responsible for its conditions mm -hmm. in some ways and that you can do practices mm -hmm. and, and take on uh, responsibilities that enable you to be able to be more flexible, stronger, more integrated, less reactive, less depressed, all those things which are, you know, believe me, great things. I, I've done this stuff. I, I, this is partly my life is to do these things. But I think that, that it's v even more important, vitally important now to along with that, and this is where something like inquiry I think allows for, is that along with that kind of inner work is we, we need two things. One is that an even more commit, you know, stronger commitment to a certain kind of, if not intellectual, then at least kind of critical questioning, that part of inquiry is also questioning in the deep sense, which means like questioning the, the, the value of the systems that I'm operating in, questioning the values that seem very positive to me, like you know, the value of flexibility. You're like, flexibility, interesting. What, what's, who's, who's, who really gets flexibility? Well, it's the, the, you know, the gig economy definitely wants flexibility out of me. You know, my ability to like constantly find any opportunity to work or to no longer believe that I deserve some kind of consistent uh, job or consistent, you know, to, no, no, I, I have to be more flexible and open. That may be the best value for you to actually emulate, but it's a two-edged sword. And if we don't acknowledge that, we're really losing part of what we should be generating in terms of our capacity to stay awake. Mm, yeah. Even if we can't ultimately change a lot of these conditions very well, and I would like to think we could, but even if we can't, then at the very least, mm -hmm. we need to stay awake. I think that's a great description. I, what, what comes to mind is when I was, I'm no longer teaching meditation as much as I used to. I used to have a studio and teach and uh, increasingly was feeling that this kind of sense of mindfulness it's been called, this kind of commodification of, and it's happening with psychedelics as well, I think. Absolutely. You know, this is, this, this sense of stripping the spirit out of it. And I remember one time getting a little bit frustrated and saying to a group, you know, of whatever, 10 people sitting there, I was like, you know what? Ultimately, meditation is about learning how to die before you die. This is all about death. We have to connect with death, and that's really at least a part of the liberation. And it went down like a lead balloon. <laughs> you know, I never did it again because there was a sense of, yeah. whoa, too real. But for me, you know, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this. That you mentioned it kind of at the beginning, this kind of commodification of, of the esoteric commodification of psychedelics. You know, it seems to be when it gets subsumed in the culture, something in it dies. Or does it? I don't know. Maybe there's some trace of it left over. Well, it's hard to know about the trace of it left over. You know, sometimes, you know, depending on the day, sometimes I'm incredibly disappointed and angry about the commodification and popularization of meditation and psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And then the other days I'm like, well, it just, it shows that people recognize that it's kind of powerful and transformative and there's going to be that crass side of it. And some of those people who come into it for, for coarse reasons, mm -hmm will have something happen to them and then they, they can't help but 
go forward in ways that they didn't even want to. And they might even end up going, I can't, act, I can't work at this job anymore. Or I can't stop thinking about death. I got to deal with the death thing. Like there's no way out. I got to get, get on, the, on, you know, on, on the horse for this one. So I, I, I very, you know, I, for me it's important to keep, continue the conversation that so many of us are happening and, and relatively quickly. It was, it wasn't that long that, that mind, I mean mindfulness has been popular longer, but, but, and it's happening even more quickly with psychedelics where people are starting to talk about this problem, yeah. this problem of commodification. This, and one way of thinking about it um, is, is again, it, it, it overly focuses on the self, mm -hmm. despite the paradox that both of these things yeah. done properly reveal that the self is not what you think it is, and in fact in many ways is composed of others, multiple others in us, and, uh, and connections, the intimate, absolute connections we have with everything else. Mm -hmm. So it's a strange paradox that in a way requires a kind of, um, a kind of dodge or a kind of forgetting, like you have to package the psychedelic or package the mindfulness in a way that keeps people thinking that they are just these solitary egos that are responsible for improving themselves so that they can form, form better in life and kind of hide the way that there's at least a, there's a strong potential that these things can also make you realize that you are profoundly you know, interconnected. Not even just in the like, I'm one with the universe way, which to my mind is actually not necessarily always the most politically helpful. But more like I'm in this room, I'm connected to my ancestors, I'm connected to you know, these experiences that I have from the place that I am, from the plants that are in the room, from the bird that's singing right now, that sense of being into, in, intimately woven into the, the world. And that was the second point where I was saying that to, to kind of balance out the potential capitalist narcissism of self-work, you know, on the one hand we need to be more critical, which of course most people aren't they don't really like to do that, but tough. We just the people who can should continue to do it more and more, yeah. and and be willing to point out the emperors without clothes and point out the mm -hmm. false ideologies that hurt people and just like harp on it. But the other thing I think that is that is that 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 turning within needs to be balanced with a, a new kind of turning without mm -hmm. or a different mode of turning without where we're, it's not about being driven around by worldly demands and just following the prompts on the phone and what the, what the, you know, your, your boss wants you to do and, you know, where you're just kind of lost in the world. But it's that having gone in and in some sense achieving detachment or observation on all those forces, there's another way of folding yourself back out where you're open and aware of the constant diversity and multiplicity of your actual experience. That we're always, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm with you, we're breathing the same air, the light's coming in, the camera's doing its own thing with its own sense of time that's already distorting from the moment. Mm -hmm. There's all these reflections that are, you know, whatever. Like that is not just trivial setting. Yeah. That's actually who we are to some, to mm -hmm. some extent. And I think that there's a couple reasons that this is a valuable adjunct, or not even, it's not even an adjunct, a, a way of, of opening up meditation, let's say, to this turn without. Because a lot of meditation practices are like, no, just either ignore it or just recognize it as just a rising and falling phenomena, don't attach to it, don't think about it. And I'm like, okay, that's part of it. but. You know, some of my most profound experiences and illuminating experiences have been actually when I'm much more intimately connected with the phenomena around me and the beings around me. And the reason, one of the reasons I think that's important is that it balances out the potential narcissism with a sense of responsibility and connection with actual agents, particularly non-human ones. And you know, one of the ways we understand the environmental condition that we're in is to be painfully aware of the way in which we are always woven into these larger shifts and, and forces, good and bad, in the, in the environment. Yeah. So in that sense, becoming very aware that like every, you know, every day I'm eating plastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's horrifying. I don't want to think about that. Not much I can do about it. Mm -hmm. And yet by being okay with that, which is in a way being okay with dying, 
I can recognize that this is an actual reality that we are all in right now and that if there is anything to do about it, which is not altogether clear to me, uh, that that comes through being willing to really embrace that sort of a gruesome reality. So there's, a, there's an element of the kind of acceptance of the outside both as a horror and as a, a realm that's populated with many possible relationships that I think balances out a sort of narcissism that can be a little, uh, you know, can be kind of, I'm, oh, I'm, I figured out how to have bliss inside myself, so I'm not going to let those things bother me anymore. I'm just going to stay this way. And that can be helpful. It can be ne absolutely necessary at points in our lives. I'm, I'm not a black and white person about mm -hmm. this stuff. But I, I think at the point we are now, we also need to come up with new ways of really with wide eyes or open eyes yeah. connecting with the world around us. So what you're just talking about, this, this sense resonates with me a lot, this idea of the necessity of something beyond the ego, something outside of us. And, and yeah, I think there is a narcissism in a lot of the inner practices which are simply based around self-improvement, you know, bigger, better, faster, stronger. So Terence McKenna talked about, he, he had this phrase that the transcendental object at the end of time, this kind of strange attractor pulling history towards it. Um, which is a fascinating concept I'd love to get your thoughts on in terms of how it relates right now. But I very much have the sense that um, the, the death of God, Nietzsche's death of God, is, is also what we're living in. There's the, we, for the first time, don't have something that is coherent uh, in the West that kind of draws us towards it. Like there is a kind of final mystery at the end of things that's beyond all of us. So how important is that right now for navigating this kind of crazy, crazy world that we're in? Yeah, that's a, that's a really tough one. Um, I mean, just to talk about Terence's idea, I think you're right, you put your finger on it, is that even though on the one hand it is a crazy idea, it is also clearly sort of allegorically appropriate to our moment. I mean, you start to go, like you go, Terence had this idea of the time wave, that you could sort of understand the structure of the development of his history and the increasing amounts of novelty by finding a mathematical object in the I Ching and super crank kooky stuff. And I, I talk about that in the book as like, how did he believe, why, why did he hold on to this? You know, is this really a valuable idea? It doesn't really hold water. But from another angle, it doesn't really matter because he, he was clearly trying to articulate something that feels true about history, this sort of ramping up, this sort of techno technology, the, the sense that we're entering these asymptotes. And Wilson talked about that too, even in the, in the early 70s, he was saying, here we go. I mean, he, and he would even draw charts of like intelligence increase and, and you know, he believed that we were going to go off world. And like, so there was, all three of the guys were very, they were not back to the landers. They were transhumanists. They were looking forward and through and up was their kind of, their kind of attitude in, in, in different ways. Um, but now we're in this situation where the, the, if the secular idea of progress once held that place, we, 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 nobody really believes that anymore. And it, if the people do, it's, it's, not, it's at the very least naive and often kind of pernicious. I mean, Silicon Valley still tries to you know, get, make money or get attention or whatever by going, oh, there's something, there's a new thing, we can make an improvement, it's gonna progress, we'll have a better, and you're like, no, no, I, look, every, all this technology you produced is, has all these unintended consequences that just make the world more chaotic. Uh, more confusing and more irritating. Like I find the everyday life with technology incredibly irritating because it's just all this crappy software and, and pushes and things that are trying to trick you into like joining their thing and then you sense this kind of algorithmic like parasites that are just like waiting to eat your every decision. I mean it's a very dystopian situation even if the ac our actual experience is pretty pleasant most of the time uh, compared to other people in the world. So this progress thing doesn't really work, but in a way, Terence found a kind of alchemical mythology that still would work. He didn't have to say, oh, we're progressing towards utopia. In fact, sometimes his descriptions of what happens at the end of time were not necessarily so you know, pleasant. Uh, uh, but that sense, and, it was, and I think it also comes about based on the phenomenology of, of psychedelics. At least for some kinds of people, I can't say this for everyone, but I think if, if you are people like 
me and I suspect you and Terence, where you read a lot of stuff, you know a lot about history, you know a lot about religion, you know a lot about popular culture, you know a lot about technology, we know you're, you're thinking and modeling the world constantly, you add a psychedelic to that and it's, it's sort of like intensifies and kind of reaches like a breaking point and you have the, and because the, time, the sense of time in psychedelics is so different than our ordinary sense of time, um, there's a, a great phrase that the scholar Hans Jonas had writing about the, the early Gnostics in the, in the ancient world where he says that the Gnostics internalize eschatology. Mm -hmm. That means they take the end of time, which is usually thought of as a historical event, and they internalize it, they experience it themselves. And in a way, psychedelics let you, or sometimes without you even wanting to, do that. So you have an apocalyptic scenario, or you become a messiah at the end of time, or you're Christ on the cross, or some kind of apocalyptic event where it all comes together. That's also just sort of part of the phenomenology of it, at least for historically aware you know, human beings. So what do we do if we don't have those things? Like it's sort of what you're saying. What do we? We don't have a progress. We don't have a God. We don't have some, uh, you know, some model or or idea. And there, I I I don't know because I feel like I have come to certain va values and meanings that are true for me. I don't think they're just true for me. I do think they're kind of true. Uh, and, and, you know, when people are interested, I'm happy to, like, pull them in. Uh, but at the same time, I do recognize that, that the minute you really turn those into some kind of mass concept, the same crappy stuff starts to happen to those ideas as to other ideas. I mean, I'm very anti-guru. I don't think it's helpful for people. But I don't know, because I, I think that the people who have the, the existential capacity to be in ambiguity to take responsibility for their not knowing, to still remain skeptical and, ev and, and evidence-based without becoming uh, you know, reactionary rationalists, to continue inquiry with a capital I and all the meanings that that has, you know, that's not an easy road to hoe. The people who can do it should do it. The people who might do it should be drawn into doing that. But the people who aren't going to want to do that who it's too terrifying, it's not their style, it's not what they do. I don't know how to say what that is, you know, what, what's going to work, you know, whether it's just commitment to loving your friends or uh, commitment to, you know, your, the social justice or to environmental things or whatever it is, um, or even not going a lot of places, like how do we, how do we keep, you know, fascism at bay now, I mean, that's a real question we all have to ask now, like how we're out here, you know, wondering about the construction of reality and doing our breathing or whatever, and meanwhile down the road is that, you know, all these cultural systems are being weaponized and they're resonating with powerful emotions that, that answer much, in much more simple terms, to the same existential problem that we've been talking about. So that's going on, it's not going away, it's probably getting worse, and so how do we build a, just a life, a culture, a way of dealing with the multiplicity of people and, and diverse perspectives that is going to actually have some real oomph against some other things that are, are, are kind of out, outpacing us in some ways. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of like concrete fights to fight uh, that are that are intrinsically valuable, but I suspect that for a lot of us, uh, we don't we're not going to get much more than a kind of the the camaraderie of of you know an anarchs of you know the, that that you know I don't know you don't know I know you don't know I know you don't I know you know that I don't know, and yet we're actually kept connecting. We're not just trading meaningless mouth noises yeah. and there's something um, there's something hopeful or utopian in our capacity to continue to connect that I think is really valuable and it's also one of the reasons that I think social media is so incredibly toxic for the yeah. most part is is like whatever it's good for or bad for or whatever and there's a lot of things that it's, I think is it's more bad for things mm -hmm. than it is good for things in terms of politics in terms of what it does to people's personalities, what it does to the possibilities of actually reason conversation in cyberspace and not. I mean, I, again, I've been, you know, arguing about things in, in 
on the internet since the 90s and there were always flame wars but mm -hmm. things are much much more massified now and so you get this sort of mob logic and mm -hmm. anyway there's a lot of problems with it but one of the other things that it does is that it it prevents largely prevents people or or, or it pushes against people's capacity to build friend networks that have the intimate peer-to-peer you know, we're all on this leaky boat together, bailing the water together, and may, that may be it. And our ability to really enjoy the camaraderie of that, uh, uh, to affirm love and connection in the midst of the situation, rather than taking political positions and judging people whether or not they pass a certain thing. And that, that's a kind of false, um, overly so social sense of connection, which we, you know, we are also part of these larger social bodies, mm -hmm. but it's like sociology run amok. It's like people just, just acting and thinking in terms of like these large social, sociological blocks where I want something that's more like friendship, mm -hmm. spiritual friendships, peer-to-peer yeah. -peer friendship, peer-to-peer -peer spirituality, where we're like, we all know we don't know, but I know a little bit here, I can mm -hmm. inform you here, oh, you're having a tough time, let's bring this together, and that can be networks of friends that are you know, in the real physical space together, it can be far flung, but it's just not mediated through the intense social performance and, and masking and kind of meme-driven things as social media. So you know, that's something that I think is a, a, a concrete thing that people can do and should do uh, in terms of, of, if they can, of their, you know, building a kind of existential social ballast in their own lives. Seems like a really natural place to stop. This is really nicely said. Eric Davis, thank you very much. Hey, it was great.